The IMM 5373E is the sponsorship undertaking and settlement plan form that is used by sponsorship agreement holders. This video tutorial is specifically geared towards how to complete this form for sponsorship agreement holders who are following risk management plan B or C. When you open up the form, you know that you are opening the fillable version of the form because you can see these buttons at the top, save, reset, and print form. As you go along completing this form, if you need to stop midway through filling in the information, you can click on the save button, which will save it to your computer and you can reopen it again at another time. So to begin with, you'll need to check this box here. If you're doing a blended visa office referred program sponsorship, and if you're not, you will leave it blank. If you are doing a sponsorship in connection with the Rainbow Refugee Assistance Partnership, then you would check this box here. When you check the box for the Blended Visa Office Referred Sponsorship, you have additional information to include, such as the profile number for that BVOR sponsorship. If you've made a mistake by checking one of these boxes, you can undo your selection. Or if you don't want to see this undo selection, you can click on the button to reset the form. So moving on to section A, the sponsor information. This is where you will fill in information about your organization. So the first line, you're going to fill in the legal name of your sponsorship agreement holder organization. This would be the name that was placed into the SAW agreement that you had signed. Next, you will include the address information, so the number and street, city, province, postal code, for where the sponsorship agreement holder's main office is located. You will also include the primary telephone number that is used for your sponsorship agreement holder organization's sponsorship program. You will also include the primary email address that is used by your SAW for correspondence with IRCC. You also include the name of the SAW's signing authority, the person who can act on behalf of the organization and bind them to this contract, this undertaking form. Now, the SAW signing authority had to have been identified to IRCC, and that name is kept on file with IRCC. So this would need to be someone who IRCC is aware of that you have authorized to be a signing authority for your SAW. Next, when you scroll down, you're going to find information about constituent groups or co-sponsors you may have. If you don't work with a constituent group or a co-sponsor, you can select no for do you have a constituent group or do you have a co-sponsor? And then continue on filling in the rest of the form. However, if you do have a constituent group, you would select yes, and some additional information will be required from you about the organization. So the name of the constituent group will need to be inserted, as well as the authorized signing authority, again, the person who has the authority to bind that organization to a contract. Uh, you would provide their information here, as well as their date of birth, and the address information for where that constituent group organization is located. You would also need to include the telephone number and email address for that constituent group that is used in connection with the private sponsorship that they are going to be undertaking. Next, we will choose yes if you do have a co-sponsor. And co-sponsors 
can take the form of two different types. You would select which type of sponsor you are working with. It is a co-sponsoring individual or a co-sponsoring organization. Now, if you had selected at the top that you are undertaking a Rainbow Refugee Partnership, then you would need to select Rainbow Refugee Partnership Organization. In this case, we're going to select the type of sponsor as a co-sponsoring individual. When it's a co-sponsoring individual, you would need to include their family name and given name, their date of birth, as well as their unique client identification number if they had had any interactions applications with IRCC previously. They would know if they have a unique client identification number, a UCI number. You would also include any information about the relationship to the principal applicant. So if they are family members of the principal applicant, you would indicate how they are related. We also need to know the address information, apartment or unit number, city, province, and postal code, their home telephone number, if they have a cell telephone number, as well as their email address. Now, if you include more than one co-sponsor, you will need to ensure that each of those co-sponsors has separate email addresses. You can't use the same email address for the co-sponsors, and you can't use the same email address as the constituent group if you also have a constituent group. Now, if you have a co-sponsoring organization, this is what you can expect to see. You will need to provide the name of the co-sponsoring organization, so their legal name, as well as the name of their signing authority and that signing authority's date of birth. You also include the unique client identification number for that signing authority or organization if they had had any applications submitted with IRCC previously. And you would also need to indicate the relationship to the principal applicant if it's applicable. This organization may have no relationship to the principal applicant, so you can put NA if it is not applicable. You also need to provide the address of the organization where that organization is located. We'll also need to provide the organization's primary telephone number and primary email address. Moving on to section B, information about the refugee applicants. So you want to provide information about both the accompanying and non-accompanying family members. And you can refer to the Guide for Sponsorship Agreement Holders to Privately Sponsor Refugees, which is IMM 5413, to understand the definition of family members. So who you will need to include as a refugee applicant on this particular undertaking. So you will need to include the information about the principal applicant here, their family name and given names as well as their gender, date of birth, their place and country or territory of birth, their marital status, citizenship, and if they have dual citizenship, you would indicate the other citizenship as well. If you are only sponsoring a single individual who is unmarried, and if they don't have any children, then you would select no, you do not have additional family members to add. However, if this individual is married and or they have any children, you would select yes. When you do so, you will need to provide information about those additional family members. So for example, if they are married, then you will first indicate the information about their spouse. So include the spouse's family name, given name, their gender, date of birth, the place and country or territory of that spouse's birth, and then the spouse's marital status, their relationship to the principal applicant, their citizenship, and you will indicate whether they will accompany or not accompany the principal applicant to Canada. So this question generally means 
will they intend to arrive in Canada at the same time and have their application processed at the same time as the principal applicant? If it's not possible because that spouse is located in a country where it makes it difficult for them to leave or be processed at the same time as the principal applicant, then they would likely select non-accompanying. And this means that they will have an opportunity at a later date to come to Canada, perhaps under the one-year window of opportunity program. Now, when it comes to non-accompanying individuals, you do need to include those persons who are presumed missing or dead. And you also need to include any children of the principal applicant or the principal applicant's spouse, whether or not they live with those parents, perhaps they are from a previous marriage, you would still need to include those children's information in this application. And the reason you need to include them is because the Immigration and Refugee Protection Regulations has a lifetime bar currently against bringing any dependents to Canada who were not named on the principal applicant's undertaking when they were sponsored to come to Canada. And so to ensure that those family members have every opportunity to join their parent in Canada at a later date or their spouse in Canada at a later date, you absolutely need to include them on this application. Now, if you have more than one dependent to be added to the application, you would select add additional family member. And now you can scroll down after the spouse's information, you would include information about the dependent children as well. Scrolling down further, when you have multiple undertaking applications for a single family unit, where you have, for example, children who are married and have a separate undertaking or perhaps a brother wants to be processed at the same time as his married brother, uh, then you can link those applications together here as well. And if you need more than one application to be linked, then you would select Add Application. Now under Section C, this is the information about the sponsorship undertaking. You would need to read through all of these to understand what you're agreeing to when you sign this undertaking to sponsor. In particular, you're declaring that the information provided is to the best of your knowledge, true, complete, and accurate, and that you're not in default of any other sponsorship undertakings or any immigration loans. And there's quite a bit of information to read. Make sure you understand everything that you are agreeing to and that you are consenting to. This section here in particular explains what the consequences are for not doing what you agree to do. Now under section D, the settlement plan, because you are a SAW that is following risk management plan C, you will of course check mark next to plan C you would scroll down to complete your settlement needs checklist. So you're going to identify who's going to be responsible for providing each settlement need by checking the relevant box. And so by checking each box, the sponsoring group is confirming that they will provide for the settlement needs of the refugees within or before the stated time period and based on their individual circumstances. And all the settlement needs must be provided for in accordance with this new document that has been released by IRCC in November of 2023. It's called the Post-Arrival Support Requirements for Private Sponsorships. So to find out what that document includes, you'll need to read the information and you can click on this. It is a link that will take you to that document to find out more about what your post-arrival support requirements are for private sponsorship. 
You will also want to refer to the Guide for Sponsorship Agreement Holders to Privately Sponsor Refugees, the IMM 5413 Instruction Guide to learn about what your responsibilities are and how to fill out the forms. So you have responsibilities that you will need to ensure occur. And so you'll need to indicate whether it's going to be the sponsorship agreement holder, the constituent group, the co-sponsors, or whether it's not applicable. Or it could be a combination of any of these groups. So you could have all three of them being responsible, or you may choose to remove the sponsorship agreement holder, and it's the responsibility of the constituent group and co-sponsors. Or it may just be a responsibility of the co-sponsors. But keep in mind that regardless of what you check mark here, whether you include the SAW or not, the SAW is ultimately responsible for each of these activities in the event that your constituent group or any co-sponsors you're working with fail to meet that obligation. Now, the only time you would select not applicable is when it is an activity that does not relate to this specific refugee family or refugee that you're sponsoring. So for example, if this particular case does not have any school-aged children, then of course that option would be chosen as not applicable. And when you select not applicable, there is a drop down box that is asking you why this particular activity is not applicable to this case. Now you'll notice that you have a timeline of activities to complete. And so you'll start out with what needs to be done over the duration of the sponsorship period. What are ongoing tasks that need to be done regularly? and when you receive the notice of arrival transmission. And then at the time of arrival and within the first three weeks, these are the activities that you need to assign persons to. And scrolling down, you have activities that need to be assigned for months one through three after the arrival of the refugees, as well as during months four through six, seven through nine, 10 through 12, and while these are specific activities that are listed, it is not a complete list of what needs to be done for the sponsorship. Uh, it's a, a key list of things that need to be done, but there are going to be additional things that may be unique and specific to these particular refugees you're sponsoring. Now scrolling down, you will have a financial needs checklist. And in the financial needs checklist, we have financial needs that are divided into two categories. You have the one-time startup costs, and you also have ongoing monthly costs. And so you will need to indicate the kinds of things that will be provided. And so again, when you're completing this section, you always want to refer to the post-arrival support requirements for private sponsorship. It gives you all the information you need to know when you're talking about the financial commitment, the financial needs. And you will also refer to Appendix A of the Guide for Sponsorship Agreement Holders to Privately Sponsor Refugees. So that's the instruction guide, IMM 5413. And that Appendix A is specifically providing information about your financial requirements. And so you're going to check mark all of the things that you will be providing under one-time startup costs, as well as the basic needs, shelter, transportation, and communication. Now, none of these are optional. <laughs> you do need to check mark that you are providing these things. These are mandatory uh, items that you will need to provide. Now, for Sponsorship agreement holders who are following Risk Management Plan C. You also have a sponsorship cost estimate. And this cost estimate is used by IRCC to assess your financial capacity as part of the sponsorship application. And in determining this, uh, IRCC 
uses the resettlement assistance program rates and policy in the community where the refugees will live. And so to understand your financial requirements and how the cost estimate is calculated, you will refer to the post-arrival support requirements for private sponsorship. Now keep in mind the total amount of committed funds that your group is going to provide must be equal to or higher than the minimum financial requirement, that total cost to sponsor the family. So right now you can see that under a minimum financial requirement, it shows a family size of zero and a zero dollar minimum financial requirement. And this is because we have yet to insert the information about the refugees we are sponsoring. So let's scroll to the top and do that now. So under section B, we will indicate the information about the refugee family we're sponsoring. So we're putting in the principal applicant's name. And as soon as we do that, if we were to scroll down to the bottom, we can now see that we have a family size of one. And when you are sponsoring a single individual, the minimum financial requirement for that single individual is 16,500. And you can refer to the cost table amounts in Appendix A of the IMM 5413 instruction guide. And you will see that this is the figure for a single individual being sponsored. Now, if you are sponsoring more than one person, so a family, let's scroll to the top and add those family members. So we have additional family members that we have added. We have the spouse. And we also have a dependent child. As soon as we add the dependent child and the spouse's name, then when we scroll down under the minimum financial requirement, we now see a family size of three. And when you have a family size of three, the minimum financial requirement changes. And if you were to refer to Appendix A, where you will see the cost table amount in the IMM 5413 guide, you will see that a family size of three has a minimum financial requirement of $26,700. And so this is the minimum amount that your group will need to demonstrate that they have set aside for this particular sponsorship. And so the amount that you are demonstrating you have as a group must be equal to or higher than this figure here. So let's take a look at the amount of money that the group is going to provide. Now to start off with, you can reduce the cost of sponsorship by collecting donated items. Some things you can purchase in advance. You can collect things in advance as well. So perhaps you may have somebody who's willing to donate a couch and some chairs and maybe some kitchen supplies. Uh, you can indicate those things here. And you need to calculate the value of what those things are equal to. So for example, if somebody donated a single bed, you might take a look at Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji and see what the approximate value of that bed would be if you were to purchase it used. And a single bed might be approximately worth $100. And so you would put that approximate value underneath the items donated. So for furniture, you would want to calculate the estimated value of all of the furniture that you had collected and insert that total amount here. Same goes for clothing, as well as household effects, linens, and any school fees or supplies that you may have collected, and any food staples as well. And keep in mind for each of these donated items, there is a maximum percentage amount that you can insert here and you can't exceed that amount. You do still need to provide money to the refugees so that they can purchase the things that they need and make the decision on what they would like to have for themselves. So as a demonstration, I'm just going to fill in some figures now. So this is the total amount 
of in-kind deductions that we can reduce the cost of sponsorship by for this family of three. So 4,656 is the amount we can use. Now keep in mind, for any items that you purchase new that you're going to apply as in-kind deductions, you will need to keep the receipts and submit those receipts uh, if requested by IRCC if they do a case review. For any donated items, you will need to keep a list of each donated item and its approximate value, as well as the name and phone number of the individual who donated that item for this sponsorship. And you will need to provide that as a proof document in the case that IRCC does a case review uh, and wants to confirm that those donated items were actually collected and received by the refugees. You can now see that the total financial requirement has been reduced to 22,43.50 as compared to the original calculation, which was 26,700. So you had a bit of a savings there for the cost of sponsorship. Now when it comes to total committed funds, this is where you're going to indicate how much money the sponsorship group is providing. And so let's take a look at funds held in trust. Let's say this particular group has placed $15,000 into a funds held in trust account. You need to now explain how these funds held in trust were collected. If it was collected from the co-sponsoring individuals, so family members of the refugees here in Canada, you would need to indicate that they had saved this income from their earned income and provide copies of their notice of assessment to prove that they had earned enough income to be able to save that amount of money that was deposited for the sponsorship. You always want to provide proof documentation to demonstrate a paper trail of the source of the funds, because ultimately IRCC wants to be assured that the funds has not come from the refugees themselves. And they need a paper trail as proof, because just taking your word for it is not sufficient proof. You need to be able to show them that the funds did not come from the refugees. And so here it shows that the total committed funds is $15,000. And unfortunately, we can see that the balance of funds is a negative amount here. We're shortfall by $7,043.50. So we should either match the amount of the cost of sponsorship and in fact, it's better to exceed the total cost. So we're going to say that the sponsoring group has collected 25,000 and deposited that in the funds held in trust account. When we scroll down, we can see the total committed funds is 25,000 and that the balance is a surplus. We have more money than we need for this sponsorship, which is good because the balance cannot be a negative amount. And in fact, you wanna see a surplus because there are always things that come up that are unexpected. So this can be considered to be part of your contingency fund. And scrolling down to section E, you will be signing that you as the sponsorship group confirm your intention to provide financial and non-financial support to the sponsored refugees and you agree to provide those supports in accordance with the post-arrival support requirements document, and you consent to IRCC providing your contact information to the government-funded Refugee Sponsorship Training Program, RSTP, for the purpose of receiving information and training on settlement planning. That way you can prepare well for the arrival of the refugees you have applied to sponsor. So you're going to have the SAW signing authority, insert the name here, and then 
if you are working with a constituent group, you would indicate the signing authority name for the constituent group, as well as any co-sponsor's names that you are working with. When it comes to the signature block, IRCC is allowing digital signatures. And so to provide a digital signature simply means that that individual themselves needs to type their name underneath the signature block. And they will date when they sign their name. Now, typically, you will want the date of their signature to be the same date as when you are submitting their application. And so the same goes for the constituent group signing authority. That individual will need to type their own name in the signature block, which represents their digital signature. And the same goes for the co-sponsor. You may choose to still have the signing authorities use a pen to sign their name. That's perfectly acceptable. So in this case, you would leave the signature blocks blank and you would print the form out, have those individuals sign in pen if that is your preference, and then you will scan the form back into an electronic version to send to IRCC via the permanent residence portal. Scrolling down, this last bit of information is just so you understand how IRCC will use the information provided in this form. When you are finished completing and signing this form, you're going to scroll to the top of the page until you can see the print form button. You'll click on that to save a PDF version of your form in a flattened version, which can no longer be edited. To do this, you're going to select from your printer options, Microsoft Print to PDF. Once you select that and click Print, you will have a PDF version that can no longer be edited. 